I make them share the grade. So it's like, you cheated, you thought you were going to get an A, we're going to cut that thing right in half, and so you're going to get half the grade, and he's going to get half the grade. So you both feel it, right? So when we talk about cheaters, we want them to feel it, don't we? Especially when we're talking about cheating in a relationship. So once upon a time, before Stacy was in my life, I was in college at Florida State, woo woo, and uh, I met, get out of here, I, m I met somebody and asked her to marry me. I was married before I met Stacy, but you know how when you're young, you're stupid? Yeah, that was me. So I was working a lot. I had at one point three jobs and an internship. I don't know how I did it. Hey, college is expensive. Florida State is not cheap. So um, I'm, I've been married for months, two or three, and I have not been spending time with my wife at that time. Her name was Tiffany, by the way. Is Stacy in here? Okay. <laughs> so, Adi is. She already knew. So uh, I had a friend. His name had had a friend. His name was Billy. And he used to spend, I, and it, oh, dumb, bro, I was dumb. Because every time I came home, guess who was there with that, my wife, Tiffany? Billy was there. And I did not put two and two together until one day she's like, I'm leaving you. I want a divorce. And I'm like, what just happened? Well, Billy kind of, mm, right in there. And I, I was kind of clueless. And so my mom came and kind of like consoling me, and there was one night where we went through all the pictures and started just cutting them out, and we burned pictures of Tiffany. Like, for real, that's what we did. And so there's this old school song that kind of like boiled it all down for me. Take a listen. Do we have it? You'll hear it and you're like, oh, I know this song. See, this is what happens when you rely on internet. All right, while we're waiting, let me pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, preach your word to your people. I pray that I would decrease so that you might increase. Uh, put the gospel on display this morning, God. Just through worship, we felt your presence. You are welcome here, Holy Spirit. So use me as a, a broken vessel to communicate a beautiful truth, good news, to a people that need to hear it. Especially those of us that have put our trust in you and sometimes we veer off from what we know to be true. And so I pray you would minister to every person that is in this room in a way that only you can. Shore up what's weak, God. Draw us nearer to you because of what you have done, because of your grace, because of your mercy, because of your forgiveness that we find at the cross. And so we, we want to highlight the good news of the gospel today. We want to celebrate the power that we have through Jesus' blood and how it can change broken situations and redeem them and restore them and bring us back into a right relationship with you. So we pray this in your name. Amen. Do we got the song? This is the song I wanted to sing to Tiffany. Do we have audio? Oh, we don't have audio. Do you know, what the, do you know who that is? That's Blue Kentra. Oh, my. Blue Kentrell, and she is singing Hit Em Up style. So I'll just tell you about it. This is what, we ha this is what happens. We got it or not? Okay. So basically what she does is she finds out her, hus or her husband or boyfriend, I don't remember, was cheating. And so what does she want to do? She wants to make him pay. So what does she do? She grabs his credit card and maxes that thing out. Grabs his next credit card, maxes that thing out. Finds his clothes, throws them out. Like the whole video is just about her making him pay, right? So anytime that we feel like we've been wrong, we want those scales to be adjusted, do we not? And so as we go into chapter 3, we're going to get that very clearly. And so the big idea today is that all of us, all of us are guilty before God, but Jesus, the righteousness of God, he redeems, he restores, and reconciles us back to God. That's our big idea. So all of us are guilty, and so that song uh, kind of reminds us that cheaters got to pay, that you can't get away with doing me wrong unless there's some sort of payback, right? That I have to, I have to feel like there's some sort of equity here, some sort of balance, some sort of fairness, because you did me dirty. 
And so now I got to get you back or else it's just, it gets under your skin. And so there's some rules that were apparently broken that, that Blue wanted to express to this cheater in her life. She expected this boyfriend or spouse to be faithful, to be true to her, to be committed to her. And she finds out that he was not that. And so because he wasn't that, she maxes out his credit cards and, and goes to Neiman Marcus and spends it all and has a great time doing it because she wants to feel this sense of justice. How much more does a holy God require justice for the offense that is his creation? We sin against God multiple times on the daily. If you're a driver, you know this. I, I curse in, in multiple languages when I'm driving because it's, it's just driving in, in, in Florida. People can't drive here. They don't know how to drive. And so you're, you're just like yelling at them, and it's just like, what are you doing? And you want them to pay for cutting you off or for flipping you the bird, right? So I think when we drive, we, we begin to realize how far away we are from God. And so when we look at Romans chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 19 through 31. We see the very clear picture that Paul is painting, that all of us are guilty. Chapter 1, Gentiles are guilty. There's nothing that they can say. There's no excuse they can give. Because in chapter 1, we learn that the creation testifies to God. And so if there is a God, that means we have to respond to him in some way. So the Gentiles, non-Jews, guilty. Chapter 2, you think the Jews are safe? No, they are not. God's chosen people, they're guilty. Because they were supposed to do all these different things, and they didn't do them. And so we see that everyone is guilty. All of us are guilty, Jews and Gentiles, rule, rule breakers, rule makers, rule keepers. It does not matter. Look at chapter 3, starting at verse 9. He's talking to the Jews. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, bo that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worth worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, those are snakes, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. I think they were talking about me. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Let's pause right there. Because in your Bible, it might be set off, right? What does that tell you? That means that this is a reference to the Old Testament. Paul is using the law that the Jews love and, and think are like elevating them and using it to indict them, to condemn them, to point out that God is not happy with them. Because if you were a Jew back in the day, any time that evil was mentioned, you blamed it on the Gentiles. It's them that have the problem, not us. Does that sound familiar? Because we're always pointing the finger to them. They're the problem. It's that driver, or it's that friend, or it's that teacher, right? It's never us. But if we're honest, when we look and compare ourselves to the law of God, then we have to own these, right? Mo most of us would say, oh, I'm a nice person. I, I haven't hurt anybody. I haven't killed anybody. You have with your words. In Matthew chapter 5, that what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus flips the script and makes us guilty of the things that we, we thought we weren't guilty of. I am a murderer when I put it on Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media talking about so badly about somebody. I'm killing them with my words. I'm killing them with my thoughts if I look at somebody lustfully. And what does Jesus tell us to do? He takes it, tells us to poke out our eyes. Being he's like exaggerating, but the point is that we're all guilty. I hope you're seeing that. And so he's using God's word in the Old Testament to make this point. The Bible, the Bible was something that the Jews knew like the back of their hands. They've been studying it all their lives. They've been memorizing it. They could point out where this word was or this idea was. But they didn't know it. Because they didn't believe what, what the words were pointing back to. To a God that holds us all accountable. And so this idea of a cheater, this idea of an adulterer, right? Is true of the Jews. 
But if we're honest, it's true of us. Because there's times in our lives when we're hurt, or we're angry, or we're lonely, or we're tired, and we don't turn to God in that moment. We turn to someone or something else. And in that moment, you are a cheater on God. I want you to sit with that for a second. Think through your life. Where do you turn when life gets tough? It might be substance abuse. It might be alcohol or, or smoking weed or I don't know what your thing is. A time in my life, it was porn. And I have to own that. We all do. We're not perfect. We can't keep the law. And that's the point that Paul is making. Look at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. We're all guilty, and so we're all sinners. And so that makes problems for us and God, right? Sin makes us guilty. Sin has to be paid for. Sin is an offense against God, right? If I walked up to you and slapped you in the face, that's... That would be offensive, would it not? Yeah, but if I walked up to a cop and slapped him in the face like Alex when he's on duty, what's the difference? Now where am I going? So it depends on who I offend, doesn't it? So if I walk up to our current president, Joe Biden, and slap him in the face, what's going to happen to me now? You feeling me? So when I disrespect God, it matters that I'm offending him, and it matters to what, to what degree I'm offending him. And so the law is making me very aware that I cannot save myself. That all those different verses in the Psalms and in Isaiah and the, the law and the prophets, as the Bible was called back then, makes me aware that I'm a sinner. And that's where it has to start. There's bad news before there's good news. And the bad news is we all are cheaters. And so just like Blue Contrail wanted to make him up, uh, hit him up, right? With the credit card, guess what? There is a price to pay when we break God's law. That's just the truth of it. And we have to accept that. We have to own that. Or else we can't move on to the good news. We can't move on to the good news because we don't understand what our current situation. Right? If I'm not a sinner, then I don't need a savior. If I don't make mistakes, then I don't need help. I don't need you. I can do this on my own. That's literally what we're saying to God. I got this, God. You handle that. You handle the world, making it spin, and those people out there. I got this. And that's the height of disrespect. Because you are the creature, not the creator. And so anytime that we turn to something or someone other than God, we're cheaters, and we, we've got to own that. But check out what Keller has to say, because this is good. The gospel is neither irreligion nor religion. It's something else altogether. Religion makes law and moral obedience the means of salvation, while irreligion makes the individual a law to him or herself. The gospel, however, is that Jesus takes the law of God so seriously that he paid the penalty of disobedience so we can be saved by sheer grace. So it's not like Jesus is wiping out the law. As a matter of fact, he's fulfilling it. He's completing it. He's doing the very thing that we can't do. Right? We all drive or aspire to drive, right? And we judge people based on our ability to drive. Right? But all of us make mistakes. Raise your hand if you've run a stop sign. On purpose or by accident, doesn't matter. We all do it. So we are all bad drivers. Right? You mess up once, you're guilty. Is there anybody that's never run a stop sign? Liar. <laughs> but you see my point? We're all guilty. And so that means we're all accountable. We have to pay. But guess what? The debt is so high, we can't pay it like your student loans. Those things don't seem to go down ever. 
I'm, I broke up with Salome, hallelujah. <laughs> I still have the email. Your le- debt is paid in full. No Salome in my life. Let's look at uh, verse 21. Now, the first word there is but. That is a big, beautiful but. Take a look at it. This is the, r- the right time to look at a but. Look at that but. Mm-mm-mm. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. And I'll keep going in a second. But now, do you feel the switch? Did you feel hopeless for a moment? Like, bro, there's nothing I can do. You're asking me for $10 million and all I got is 10. I can't pay this debt. This is beyond me. There's no way I can get it right. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. God had a plan. From the beginning of time, God had a plan to deal with this sin issue that is a problem for all of us. See, the Bible has a big story that it's telling, and I don't want you to miss it, right? He created Adam and Eve in the garden, and everything was good. That's what he said, and as a matter of fact, when he created Adam, he said it was very what? Good. But then Satan sneaks in there and starts talking to Eve, and Adam didn't do his job, and next thing we know, we have this whole sin issue, where now we have disobedience, right, and rebellion, and they were trying to hide themselves with a little fig leaf, like, God, don't look at me, right? This is part of the story. And so we have this relationship that was good, but then this rebellion, this resistance to this relationship that God wants. And so what did God do? Well, they were trying to clothe themselves in a way that didn't really clothe them. And so it says in the Bible that he clothed them with fur. Where did that fur come from? An animal had to die in order to cover them in a way that was pleasing to God. He was pointing ahead to what Jesus would do. He was looking ahead at the sacrifice of Jesus. In John 1, 29, John is looking with his disciples and Jesus walks by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What did they do with lambs back then? They slaughtered them. You would go to the temple. If you were poor, you would have a pigeon. If you were rich, you would have a big old cow. doesn't matter. You would take an animal and you would put your hand on that animal to signify that uh, all my sin, this animal is taking. This is the price that was required. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us, there is no forgiveness of sin. Something has to pay. And so this, the problem with the law is that it was temporary. You'd have to do it again. Why? Because you and I are both sinners. We'd mess up. Do you know how many animals would die just because of me? So many. It would be bloody and messy, and my daughter would be very upset because her cat would be on the list. You, you see what I'm saying? It's just all these animals having to die. Why? Because I'm a sinner. Because I'm rebellious against God. Because I defy him and say, no, I don't want anything to do with you. That makes me guilty. But then I've got verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. This is what's crazy is that God had this plan in mind and he worked it out. Because the whole rest of the story, the whole rest of the Bible is this desire for relationship. He was trying to restore the relationship with his people. That's why he gave them the law. That's why he gave them the temple. That's why he gave them a promised land. Because he wanted these people, these chosen people, to, to be loved by him, to be in relationship with him, and then bless other people. Doesn't that sound familiar? A chosen people that are put on mission to love other people into the kingdom? Doesn't that sound like the church? And how well are we doing, church? I don't know if we would even get a C-. minus. We have to own that. We're called to more in God's word. And so he says, the righteousness of God, how does it come? Well, it doesn't come through following the rules. It doesn't come through killing all these cows and animals. It can't. Because you'd have to do it again and again. It has to come a different way. 
And the way it came is through God stepping down from heaven, coming to earth, and dying in our place. And that deals with that sin issue, doesn't it? Because now who's not paying the penalty? Well, I'm not paying the penalty. Are you? No, Jesus was the one on the cross. He paid that penalty. Remember, there was a price to pay. There was an offense. An offense that was made right because Jesus died on the cross and it was satisfactory to God. For all have sinned, that means all of us, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. Justified means not guilty. Don't, don't get it twisted. Not innocent, but you're declared not guilty. You go to court. I've done this before. You get caught speeding, but it's only five miles an hour over the speed limit. No, you broke the law, did you not? And so now you get the ticket. You don't want to play the ticket, so you take it to court, right? Did you speed? Yes. That means you're guilty. But you go to court, and the judge decides you don't have to pay the ticket. That's mercy. He declares you not guilty. Yes, you, you were speeding, but now he pays the ticket for you. Tickets, ticket is paid for. You're declared not guilty. You're good. You can go home, no problem. Or you do what I do and hope that the cop doesn't show up, and then they throw out the case too. You didn't hear that from me. All right? So as we look at 23 and on down, he unpacks the good news. Beautiful good news. And look at all the things that you gain from this good news. Let's pick up from uh, 24. I just told you, justified means that you're not guilty by his grace as a what? What does that say? As a gift. All right, so let's, let's see if this works. I have a gift for someone in this room. And all you have to do is demonstrate that you have faith in what I just said. We'll take 10 seconds. We'll see if that happens. I have a gift for someone in this room. And all you have to do is demonstrate that you have faith What just happened? What, what just happened? She moved. Now, let me ask you this, Rosa. Did you know that I was going to do that? Did you believe that I had a gift? How do you know that? <laughs> Did you see it? Did you feel it? It's a gift. Did you work for that? No, I just got it. I just moved. She opened her hand and she accepted it. Church, that's the gospel. All you have to do is open your hand and realize there's nothing you can do. You have no part in this process other than the sin that required it. That's it. She did not know I was going to give her that gift. It was a surprise to her. Are you happy? <laughs> I hope you're feeling this. Because that's what Paul is trying to get us to see. How beautiful. How powerful. How life changing. The gospel can be. Because you don't have to pay. He did. You owe a debt. You cannot pay he paid the debt. He paid that debt. And it, how do you access that? How did she access that little gift card? Faith. She believed, not just like belief and belief, but like put feet to her faith and walked to me. Opened her hand and said, I believe that you have a gift for me. Church, is that what we're doing with Jesus? We might, do it. we might have done it once, and then we forget and we drift. And then we try to get right back. I'm not telling you to do better and try harder. Hear me. I'm not telling you that because you can't do it. Being good is an illusion. Try being good and see how long you, you wind up being good. You realize how bad you really are. I try to be a good dad. I fail often. I try to be a good husband. I fail often. 
but I don't have to use that as my standard because I'm not the one paying for the, the price that's required. Jesus did. Let's keep looking. Justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption, he bought us back. His payment was sufficient. We read in the Gospels that Jesus said, it is what? Finished. You know what that means? Paid in full. There's no layaway with God. You remember layaway? You go to Kmart, it doesn't even exist anymore. Mama was the queen of layaway. She would go and pay like five bucks on, on the gift that she was going to send us. Then she would send another five dollars and then another. No. To be paid in full is to pay all of it. Zero balance. Nothing else is owed. That's what it means to be redeemed. He bought us back. We owed that debt. Jesus paid it. And so how do I receive it? I receive it through faith. And why? This was to show God's righteousness because in his, di uh, in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. When we look at the cross, we look backwards. And if we've said yes to Jesus, we say thank you. But if I was Abraham or David or, or even Eve or Sarah, they were looking forward. Because all those animals that died on their behalf were like a IOU. And so when Paul writes this and he says, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, this is what he's talking about. They looked ahead at their salvation. We look back. Think about that. Because in that moment that Jesus died on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, he paid for sins past, present, and future. He, he, it was outside of time and space because Abraham is now forgiven all his sins. David is forgiven all his sins. Sarah is forgiven all her sins. Why? Because she was looking ahead to what Jesus was going to do. And we can do the same thing when we look back. There is a day and time that I put my trust in Jesus and I said, yes, Jesus, I trust you. I believe that what you say is true in your word and I'm going to put my whole life on this. And so there's that distinction, because many of us have said yes, but then we don't live for him. And that was the Jews. They had the law. They had the temple. They had everything that God could give them to, to help them walk this, this life. But the problem was it was an outside-in kind of thing. But here we have, when, on this side of the cross, we have an inside-out kind of relationship now. Because the moment that I say yes to Jesus, he comes to live inside of me through the Holy Spirit. And now I have the power to do the thing that I couldn't do before, which was be obedient, to be dependent, to rely more on him and less on me. And I know there are people in this room that are like, bro, you're asking too much. My life is going to change. I can't give that I, my whole life. Like, that's too much. See, this here's what you don't understand. You don't understand what you're gaining. You don't understand what you're winning in having a relationship with Jesus. Because you get peace. You get wholeness. You get restoration. Not just between you and God, hallelujah, that's a, a fantastic thing, but you get wholeness in relationships horizontally with your family. There's a reason to work it out. Because if God and I can work it out because of Jesus' death on the cross, then guess what? I can work it out with you. Because you're worth it. If I was worth it, if Jesus died for me, and he said, Omar, you're worth it. Then guess what? You're worth it too. This was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Just and justifier. Mercy and grace are found at the cross. Mercy. Not getting what you deserved. The Bible is clear. You were supposed to, uh, the wages of sin is what? Death, spiritual separation from God forever. That's the penalty, right? When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that the curtain was torn in two, the, the, the sky was black. That's when God turned his back on his son. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took on all that sin for you. But he's the justifier. He gave you what you did not deserve. Rosa did not earn that card. 
It was a gift. And so all she had to do was accept it. Jesus did that for us. He died on the cross, and he gave us all the things that we don't deserve. Our relationship with him, peace and wholeness in our hearts, purpose, a plan, a family. You get a family when you say yes to Jesus. You don't do this by yourself, and I think that's missing in a lot of gospel presentations. When you say yes to Jesus, you get brothers and sisters that are going to walk with you in this thing. And so you get grace and mercy. And so then what becomes of our boasting? I love this part. Can you boast? Rosa, can you boast that you got that card? You can boast that it was a gift, but can you boast that you worked for it? No. Jesus did it. We didn't. We couldn't. It's, it's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. By a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Underline that thing if you're an underliner. Take a snapshot of it and remind yourself of that daily because there's the gospel right there. For that we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works. You can't save yourself. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. The law was satisfied. It looks like Jesus kind of flipped things around. No, he didn't. He didn't come to abolish the law, he says. He came to fulfill it, to complete it. The law required payment. Did it get paid? Yes, because when he died, it was sufficient. I just told you, when he said those words, it is finished, it's paid in full. Was God satisfied? Yes. How do we know? Because when he died, he didn't stay dead, amen? What happened? He rose again. That proves that God was A-OK with what just happened. And if we put our faith in Jesus, then we get what Jesus has. He takes what we don't want, which is our sin and our, our unholiness and our unrighteousness. It's like this beautiful exchange. He gets the garbage and we get the good stuff. Understand that. Because it all hinges on that. Because if you understand that, you're going to live distinctively different. You're going to be willing to sacrifice things. And you're going to grow in relationship with God, your community, and one another. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that what we're about, church? And so I'm going to talk to those of us that have said yes prior to today to Jesus. Because it's not a one-time event. Many of us say yes and think it's like this ticket in our back pocket, we're good to go. Christianity is so much more than that. The gospel should not end with you. The gift card that she just got was a gift to me. I passed it on. I received joy when I received the gift because somebody was thinking of me. I didn't work for it. I didn't earn it. I was happy that I got it, and I'm even happier now because somebody else is happy that they received the gift that they didn't work for. The gospel should not end with you. What does that mean? You should be sharing your love, your grace, your mercy, your story with the people in your life because if you keep your story to yourself, the gospel ends with you. And that was the indictment against the Jews. Is that going to be the indictment against you? There's forgiveness. I am not preaching a gospel of works. Hear me clearly. But it's a funny thing. Jesus did all the work, but he calls us to work out our our salvation with fear and trembling. We got to do some things. So we receive this justification declaring not guilty from Jesus freely, but then we've got to work out our sanctification, our growing in Christ-likeness over time. Jesus should be getting bigger in our lives. Our awareness of sin should be growing Our awareness of who he is and what he's done should be growing. Why? So then then that cross of Jesus looms larger in our life. And people see it in us. Something's different about you. Can you tell me what that is? There's your moment. There's your moment. There was a time in my life 
where I felt invisible and alone. But then I met Jesus. And now I'm, I'm known and loved. As simple as that. And here's my encouragement to you. Nobody can argue with your experience. It's what you know. It's what you know. So then why are you worried about what, how, if it's going to offend them? They tell you stories all the time. It's your turn to tell a story. It's your turn to tell your story. Stop holding it in, trying to not offend people, walking around on eggshells like, oh, I can't say that. Oh, I can't say that either. Does Jesus love you? Did he die for you? Are you happy that he did so? And tell somebody. Tell somebody. So those of us that have not said yes yet, Admit you're a sinner. Believe the words that you just heard from the God's word. That he loves you. That he died for you. Died for your sins. Died for your mistakes. Did, died for your, all your failures. And all it takes is a yes. See, that here's the thing about news. You've got to respond. Bad news makes you feel sad. Good news. That's exciting. But if you're just hearing the news and there's no response... And you really didn't hear it, did you? And so in, the, in a moment, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take communion and celebrate this, this beautiful thing called the gospel. But I don't want to let this time pass. Today might be the day of your salvation. Because all it requires is faith in what Jesus has done on your behalf. The Bible tells us if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It's as easy as that. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I started off this, this whole sermon with Blue Cantrell's hit em up style. That Jesus, or excuse me, that, that we're guilty before a holy God and that we deserve to pay. And we deserve to hear that song from God. But he sings a love song to us instead. He's enamored by you. He loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. And so if you've never said yes to Jesus before, all you have to do is accept your sin, accept your mistakes. Say, God, I'm, I'm flawed. I'm, I messed up. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. I need you. And I believe. I put my faith like I saw Miss Rosa do. I put my faith in what you've done on the cross. And I believe that my sins are paid for, that I'm, I'm okay with God, that I'm reconciled with God. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that you believe that. And you become a part of the family. You become a brother and a sister, and you gain brothers and sisters. And so if that's you this morning, you just look up at, at me so we can talk and we can pray. Thank you. Let me pray for you guys, uh, and then we're going to take communion. Uh, in the Bible, uh, chap uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Let me pray first, and then, then we'll get to that. Sorry. Thank you, God. Um, Ooh, thank you so much for your gospel. Thank you for the fact that you took care of the bad news so that I could hear good news. That you are a God who thinks ahead and already had a, a plan. You already had a plan from, from the beginning of time dealing with our sin problem, our rebellion, our resistance to you. And that was to, to step down from heaven to live in the mess that is this world, but not be stained by it, to remain obedient and pure and holy, living a, a perfect life and dying a cursed death on our behalf. And so I pray for those that looked up, God, that said yes to you. I pray for them, God, and just ask that you would just make your presence known to them. Help them to share the fact that they decided to say yes today with somebody, be it me or anybody else. 
so that we can begin this journey of walking uh, and living for Jesus day by day together as a community, as a family. And so I thank you for these elements that we're about to take, God. Thank you for the, the picture that it paints of a God who loves and a God who was willing to sacrifice, a God who was different uh, and who calls us to be different and who didn't stay dead but rose again. We put our trust and our hope in that and in that alone. And so when we fail, God, remind us of the gospel. Help us to preach the gospel to ourselves and to each other so that we might live out the vision of this church to be distinctively different, self-sacrificing disciples of Christ growing in relationship with you, our community, and one another. In your name, amen. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, and then we'll, uh, we'll begin communion. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen? And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you you see the day drawing near. In that particular passage, he's writing to Jews who were walking away from Jesus. They had said yes to Jesus, and he's saying, hold up, you, you you don't understand. And so when we take the elements, we remember what he did on the cross for us. And if you said yes, for, uh, yes to Jesus today, you can be a part of this family meal. And so you can pass the elements as I'm speaking. You can be a part of this meal because it points back to that cross that I was talking about. That he died on the cross. He paid for your sins. They are paid in full. You are no longer an offense to God. He doesn't see you anymore. He sees Jesus in your stead. All those different, like if I could make a list of all the wrongs, that I've made, it would be a book. And those are nailed to the cross, covered in his blood. And so the pages are empty. And we can hold on to that. We can remember that. And so as you take, the top is going to be what represents his flesh that was broken and bruised, crushed for your iniquities. And so he met with his disciples and he said, this is my body. Take it and and remember of me. Let's eat and remember. As he was taking this meal with his disciples, his family, He pointed out the cup, and he he flipped the script. Jesus always flips the script, and he made this cup mean something different because it was the cup of the new covenant. The old covenant, the Old Testament, was that sacrificial system that was temporary and ineffective. And he said, this new covenant, this cup represents my blood, drink and remembrance of me. And so we drink remembering that that blood, there's power in that blood. There's healing in that blood. And so carefully tear off and drink, remembering the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you so, ma- so much for the many pictures that you paint of your goodness and your grace. Thank you. Uh, that you paid for the penalty that was required of sin. That sin no longer has to have power over us because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us if we've said yes to you, if we trust you and put our faith in you. And one day there will be no more sin because you're going to come back and take us home. And so I pray for anybody that still is struggling, that still needs to have a conversation, still doesn't understand it. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work and that they would 
ask a question. How do, how do I become saved? And so as we break off into our missional community groups, God, help us to have good conversations that are focused on you and help us to grow in our relationship with you. We pray in your name. Amen.